So here's a neat little repair that I'm kind of excited to get into and get finished. It is a really nice little casting. It's a steady rest, or it was, off of a small south bend lathe. You can see right there it's broken completely in two. And then we got a pretty good crack over here. So the top is almost broken completely off of the base. You can't buy these anymore, at least as far as I know. They ain't made these in a long time. So the only option is to either repair this or make a complete new one. And what we're going to do is try to attempt to repair it. So let's get it prepped out. We'll get a plan together and then uh, see if we can't uh, stick this thing back together. So a little closer look at the damage. Let's get this wire that's holding it together off. When, uh, when somebody breaks something like this, it's, it's somewhat devastating, right? It's not the easiest part to repair. But I think we can do it, and I'm sure it'll probably be as good as it ever was once we're done. So, completely broke there. And then, I don't know if you can see that little crack there, but we're going to have to get to the bottom of that and uh, repair it on this side as well. But first, we'll do the big break, and then we'll come over and uh, work on the small one. So the first thing that we're going to do is grind out a very large portion of the damaged area. We're going to leave a small portion, that way they key back together and keep everything located the way that it should. Then we'll come back and fix that area that we leave uh, after we're done with the first part. I'll show you, you'll see. So after looking at this thing a little closer, it's probably going to be a three-step repair. Because it's so contoured here, I mean there is a lot of shape in this. Uh, I'll probably come in and burr out the top here and repair that. Then come in, do the bottom or the back side the same way. And then maybe have to come in and burr this crack out in the front. I want 100% penetration on this. And I don't want a big gob of uh, brazing alloy left over. I just want it to look like it does now once it's repaired. And, uh, you know, it'd be a quality repair instead of just a hack job with a bunch of bubble gum all over it. This will be easy, this small crack, but this one's going to take a little time. So I've got the first section burred out pretty heavy there on this repair. I'm just lubricating these O-rings on this. Uh, this is a SW205 brazing tip. It's what we're going to start out with. And these O-rings are pretty sticky. This thing slides together, but this dry graphite uh, really seems to make things slide together much nicer. Keeps them from getting all scuffed up and leaking. So let's get this torch fired up and uh, start heating this thing up and stick it together. So whenever I can, I like to use gravity in my favor, right? We got the lowest part of it down. That way it'll puddle in the bottom there. Maybe make life a little easier on us. Yeah. Flow meter on the oxygen side is bouncing, causing my flame to be erratic. I'm going to have to take that out of this setup before I start brazing.
So that turned out pretty good. Um, took a while to get it hot though. I probably should step up a size and torch uh, and tip and we'll do that on the on the other sides. So in case it's not obvious what I'm doing here, I'm brazing up one side, then on the opposite side I burr down until I reach my brazing alloy, and there's three sides to do here basically. That way everything stays in its original orientation, you know, the crack had everything keyed together when I brazed the first side together, so now that that's connected I can just bra burr down on this side till I reach my alloy, and then you know, braze this side up. So. Just a way to keep everything in orientation and get 100% penetration on this part, the alloy. We're climbing up the garage wall with the cable. I got the shotgun mic on, so maybe you can hear them in the background. It's just now starting, but they're buzzing. Bunch of them right here, I'll get a shot of it. So when I'm pocketing these cracks out to braze them up, I try to get the pocket pretty wide because I don't want to have to be trying to braze down in a in a narrow uh, slot. I also want to try to remove any of the real sharp edges. Those edges will just get superheated by the torch. They won't accept the brazing alloy. You'll burn off all the flux, and then you're left you're left with a void. So I try to be conscious of how I burr this out so I get a successful job. This torch head's clogged up. Yeah. Torch head's clocked up. Dirt. There's little uh, bugs around here that will fill up any hole that is open. not the first time that's happened. So I decided to go through my torch heads and just see if any of the others were clogged up. Check out that one. It's just completely packed full of mud. So I'm just cleaning them out real quick. Also checking out the O-rings on all of them while I'm at it. See, these are all split up on this one. Luckily, I've got some replacements. So even if stuff's sitting in a closed drawer, so it doesn't keep all the bugs and stuff out, and it doesn't keep your O-rings from dry rotten either. Change these out real quick. Be back in business.
pretty much it on this side anyway. And I went around all three faces. And turned out pretty good. Now it's just time to clean off the slag and uh, take a burr around on it, smooth it out and make it look more better. So it's cracked to about right there with the my makeshift developers telling me anyway that's just crushed up uh, welding flux. My can of developer in my kit, it's completely empty. So we had to make, make do. So check that out. That turned out as good as good as it could, I guess. And it's going to be strong as or stronger than it ever was. I left a little extra buildup in both these areas to, to reinforce it because it's obviously a weak spot. But shouldn't break again, not under normal use anyway. So that's pretty good. I'm going to leave it up to the owner to prep and paint it. So that's the way you repair cast iron, in my opinion. All the way 100% penetration, right? If we didn't bubble gum it up on the outside, it looks as good as it ever did, and it's as strong as it ever was. So there you go. When cast iron breaks, a lot of people are obvious, or a lot of times devastated because they don't believe it can be repaired, but it can. It just takes a little work. So there you go. Looks good, in my opinion, anyway.
so you can see, hopefully, all these holes in the ground. That's where those cicadas come from. They just burrow out of the ground. They make a little thing called a chimney. But right before they emerge, right, they build this mud stack. Here's a little better look at part of one, anyway. Right here is the top of one. Yeah, you can see that. You get something like that. And then once the here's more. Once the ground gets the, to the temperature that they want, they just break out, and then they crawl out. They come out of their little shells and uh, get their wings and fly around and do their business. Pretty neat. That's cool. Yeah, another one right there. And there's one over here as well. They're definitely coming out. So today my little girl graduates from high school and soon on to college. She's having trouble with her shoes. She needs more holes in the band. And my wife keeps asking me, do you really need all these tools? And then an example like this comes up and she completely understands. That's it. Seventy-six thousandths. So it doesn't seem like I should have a child that's old enough, well, an adult, actually, um, old enough to be graduating high school, and it won't be long before my son graduates as well. They definitely grow up fast. My daughter, on to college, right? She's going to, her, her interests are uh, potentially being a vet, so it's exciting. So I should probably center drill these first. <laughs> Congratulations, all. Grand Charlie wants a picture of me and you with her. Here, Grand, hold that. So back about five or six years ago, when I originally got into hand scraping, I needed some carbide blanks to turn into scraper blades. And I bought a random pack of large carbide inserts, just regular for insert tooling, nothing special, just a big chunk because I wanted to turn it into scraper blades. And I ended up making a holder for these inserts. And I used them. They work just fine, but they are awful thick. I mean, that's probably, I don't know, 200 thousandths thick. Yeah, 190. 
thousandths or 4.8 millimeters thick. That's quite a, a chunk of carbide and it's really too thick to be honest because when you go to sharpen them, it just makes more material that you have to remove. Basically, you gain nothing uh, from the thickness other than some strength that's not needed. So, what I've decided to do is make a new scraper from this actual store-bought, actually uh, Lance Baltza gave me this scraper. It is a DAPRA uh, name brand Biax scraper. And I'm going to modify it to fit me. It can take much thinner blades, so what I did is took my old scraper blade that I had made for this and I thinned it down, cut it down by about half, so this is about a hundred thousandths thick uh, versus the uh, or 2.6 millimeter versus the almost 200 thousandths, so basically halved it and I put a mirror polish on it. I don't know if you can see that or not. Factory finish, dull gray. My finish is uh, basically mirror finish. And what that does is that just allows that edge that you produce on these to get razor sharp. The duller the finish, the, the more uh, rough the surface is uh, with it when it comes to carbide. So it's common practice to polish these to a mirror finish. And that's what I've been doing. And I want to run through that real quick and show you just how I did it because it's interesting. And I want to share it with you. So let me show you the process that I went through to get that finish. So for demonstration, I'm only going to do one side of this insert because I really need to grind it to cut its thickness in half. So we'll just do one side for now. And what I'm going to use is this strip of copper. And I've got it labeled 14, 7, uh, 3.5, and 1.5. Basically, every stage is half as coarse as the last stage. The abrasive is diamond paste. Now I bought this stuff off eBay. I think I paid $12 when I bought it. A whole kit of more than enough diamond paste to last your average person their entire life. Now that's been quite some time ago and I don't have a link, but you get the idea. Um, just search diamond paste. This is the cheap stuff, right, overseas, but, you know, it's diamond paste and it seems to be uh, pretty good. Um, what you're going to gain with the higher quality pastes um, is just a finer uh, separation of particle size, right? There may be a stray large chunk of diamond in this that may make your day bad when it comes to getting the surface finish you want, but you get the idea of the classification. This stuff is pretty good in my experience. So we're starting out pretty rough, 14 micron on the diamond plate and just put it on there, spread it around and just rub it until, uh, you know, until you've got the entire surface uh, scuffed up to a point to where it's 14 micron, right? Taking all the hollows out of it and got it good and flat. You can hear this stuff cutting the, uh, the heavier abrasive and it just kind of embeds into this piece of copper and sticks around pretty good. So that's it. Now just rub this until it's good and flat, spinning it around kind of. Trying not to get this paste outside of its area because I don't want to contaminate my, uh, uh, th you know, smaller abrasive. So I've been doing this for just a minute, put some gloves on. Really, you don't need to polish the entire surface, just really around the cutting edge, uh, to be honest. But, you know, I polished the whole whole deal. But, um, you probably can't see that. It's really fine. But really, all I'm doing right now is just cutting around the edge. This is probably dished and not cutting in the middle yet. So I'm going to put rub on this until I get the this entire surface down to a 14 micron finish. So I'll just continue this and when I'm done I'll bring you back and we'll move on. So I just finished up with a 14 micron. I've cleaned everything meticulously, right? The lap, the part, my gloves, trying to get away all of that heavy abrasive because now I'm cutting 
particle size in half, go into 7 micron, and I'll continue to step down, cutting my abrasive uh, particle size in half until I get to about 0.5 micron. That's just what's working with the, you know, the abrasives that I have. So same thing over and over until I get to the very end, and then I'll show you uh, how I get that nice mirror finish, or how I have so far uh, on these parts. So the idea here is that each step I take removes the scratches that were put in it by the previous step. So we cut our particle size in half from 14 to 7. You know, because these are the grit sizes that I have and the smallest steps I can take, you know, that's the, the, probably the best way to do it, or at least that's the way I was taught when you know, using sandpaper with wood. You, know, you don't really gain anything by taking big leaps in particle size. You're probably going to work about the same amount of time uh, no matter which way you go. But if you take little steps at a time, or the smallest steps you can, you're more likely to end up with a really nice finish without any big stray scratches in it. So I've moved over to a paper towel for the final one and then the 0.5 micron. And the reason for that, at least what I've experienced is the 1 micron and the 0.5 micron don't seem to cut very well when you put it on a hard surface. Because it's suspended in oil and I've got a part that's flat when I move it back and forth, it really seems to just get up on that oil film and not get cut by the diamond. But if I apply it to a paper towel, that diamond gets down into the towel and it doesn't it holds it in place. There's no oil film to skate on and it seems to cut much better and just work faster. Just from what I've experienced, I don't know exactly that that's what's going on, but it just seems to work quicker like this. I'm almost finished, and I'll show you what we got here. So there you go. That's about as polished as it's going to get by me anyway. Nice mirror finish. A couple little stray scratches on it from contamination from the larger cutting grits. Here's the other side for comparison. I had to put a dot on it so I could remember which side was which in the beginning stages. But you get the idea. That looks pretty good. And you only got to do it once, right? Because every time you sharpen it, it'll run right back. And the cutting edge will be that nice, polished, clean surface. You only got to do right at the cutting edge. But when you do the whole part, right, you, you just do it that once and you're done. So, there you go. That's how I do it. Use the paper towel in the finishing stages and it works out really well. So check out the new shop dehumidifier. Turn it off so it's not quite as loud, but it's so much quieter in comparison to the old unit. Now this is a Storm LGR Extreme, just a bigger unit, uh, far more capacity, more suited to the size shop that I have. Um, I picked this up off of Amazon and so far, so good. This thing has been uh, been working just fine. I've been using it for a couple weeks, and and I like it. Uh, this one sounded like you were running a Volkswagen in the shop. You know, this one sounds like you're running a fan. You can't hardly hear the compressor, uh, you know, and it's programmable. Uh, both were are programmable to a certain degree. This one is far more. Uh, monitor it from your phone, you can set when you want to turn on, off, you can set the points where you want the humidity to be monitored from, I mean it's a pretty neat unit. Um, quite a bit more expensive than a unit like this, but if you're going to run something 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, it needs to be a pretty good unit, and I'm hoping that this one will hold up for me. So we'll see. Uh, the major difference to this one uh, versus the old one is that this one has an internal pump. So the outlet of the hose that you see running across the floor does not need to be below the outlet of the, or below the unit. It can actually be 
uh, in theory, up to 15 feet uh, high. So you could run that hose out a window of a second story and uh, it would still pump the fluid out where the old one was simply reliant on gravity to drain. So no, no chance of flooding the shop with this one. There was a few times I did uh, uh, have the hose loose on this one and come out here and there's a huge puddle in the floor because they remove an, an amazing amount of water. Let me show you the difference in humidity from inside the shop versus outside of the shop uh, this morning. It's a pretty, pretty big difference. So the shop weather station says it is 48 degrees outside with 90% humidity and 59 degrees inside with 44%. So was it 40, 46% difference? So obviously that dehumidifier is working. So pretty neat little weather station there as well. We got one for the house, but I figured I'd pick one up for the shop. Nice, got a little remote sensor on the outside of the building and it just sends uh, the weather information in here and displays it, so neat little unit. A brood of cicadas show up. I think it's brood X is what these are referred to. Little gnats all in my face. Get out of my face, bugs. So hopefully you can hear the noise that those cicadas are making. I don't see how my mic could avoid uh, you know, not picking that up. But it's like a wave and they all seem to be in unison together. It's crazy. There's you know, billions, I'm sure, uh, out flying around right now. And we're just now starting to get a good showing of them. Believe it or not, it gets louder than this. Uh, it gets to a point uh, where it's just almost deafening loud. But it doesn't happen that often. Every 14 years, I believe, they come out of the ground. 14 or every 17 years. Somebody can correct me in the comments uh, if I'm wrong. I believe these are referred to as Brood X Cicada. Um, there's a few different types, actually. This is not the only time that cicadas show up. I think there's three different types here in the eastern U.S. that uh, make a show in every so often. I think there's a three year and maybe a six or seven year. Not exactly for sure on that, but I do know that there are different types that show up at different times. But this happens to be the largest group of them. And it's pretty impressive. Their little bodies are scattered around everywhere. And all the little animals will be eating good because they all eat cicadas. So it's interesting. Interesting to see. Can get quite annoying though after a while because it's crazy loud. So believe it or not, it's quieter inside the shop than it is outside of the shop, at least right now it is. But I can hear those cicadas pretty well in here. It's just gonna get louder. We just now started to see a good show into those things. I can see their little bodies all over the trees outside of the windows. But it's gonna get pretty intense probably in the next week or so, I'd guess. Now this week has been, it's been a really a busy week for me, good and bad. I guess it depends on the way that you look at it. I've had a lot going on. My daughter, she just graduated from high school this week, so congratulations to her. You know, that's kind of one of those things where we're like, you're like, wow, you know, I've got a daughter that's old enough to graduate, and also me and Elizabeth decided it was a good time to let little Chestnut the squirrel go. We didn't film that. Elizabeth didn't want to. Just like all the other squirrels, we just had been introducing little Chestnut to the outdoors for quite some time, and he was ready. And, you know, he's been ready for over a month. We just held on to him because we could, and it was time. Weather's nice, and you know, he was ready to go. So hopefully we'll see him around. I'm sure we probably will. Um, you know, just one of those weeks, right, where everything seems like it's leaving the nest, and you're, you're like, what? Where is time gone? And it all happens fast, real fast. So you got to pay attention in the moment, or else, you, you know, or else it'll pass you by. So I think that's it this week. I got some exciting stuff to get started on next week that I'm looking forward to, to starting to build on. So I think that's it. So that's it, I guess. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's supported me on this project, my YouTube adventures in general. So thumbs up, thumbs down. Leave me a comment. I appreciate it. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born, you're just a friend
flower on your own, waiting for the sun to blossom, hoping to break through.